but the idea of kind of having some equitable lens around that, that helped. Did the site's budget for supplies mm -hmm. in a classroom, did, that, did they go up? Um, I, we have information on what they have this year. Sites would have to know. I would like to say, too, we asked principals about this question. One of the things I thought we had agreed on is that issues would go to the site principal. So we're, no principal is aware of sites not getting their money or things not happening at the site level. So no one really understands kind of what this question is. Is it that they have more money? Because that wasn't the question. So I don't have an answer to that. Some sites might have decided to distribute their money in different ways. I don't know. Because we don't track or mandate a formula for the distribution of their dollars at the site. OK. Then the, the second question, or piggyback on that, did the departments receive more money? Secondary, we have departments. Mm -hmm. Did their, their uh, income go up? I don't know if sites chose to do that differently this year. That isn't information we asked the sites about because that wasn't did sites get their money to distribute to teachers as far as we know yes every site has gotten it and principals don't know that there's a problem somewhere where they feel like sites grade levels teachers subject areas don't have their money that wasn't reported back to us as something that's going on okay because I, I think the main concern was teachers who were going out and buying supplies that they needed for their classes, mm -hmm. whether colored pencils for the students or construction paper, binder paper, whatever the case might be. And like I said, I wasn't here last year, so I'm just, what was given to me, I'm regurgitating out from my understanding of, of their comment. So again, if there's a site in particular where they knew their allocation was $250, they went out and spent it, turned their receipts in and haven't gotten their money, or something like that, then we can follow up with that individually. But I, I don't know of a place where people aren't getting their site allocation. Okay. That now I'm sure they're always too little. I mean, I'm sure they're too small. I mean, we kind of accept that as a premise, I think, in this job. And we also know that the Title I regulations that came down where um, we can't require some things in class anymore because it uh, disproportionately affects low-income students, whether that be things like calculators or binders, all of those things that we think are important tools in the classroom that we can't force a student to have anymore to, uh, because we know some families can't afford it. We do know that um, that requires an investment, but again, we don't have new dollars, but I know that Diane's always working with principals and um, teachers to see what the different subjects need and how we make that work. So that, for example, in math, they have a different need at the secondary level for some of those tools than other teachers. Art teachers we know have ongoing consumable, um, as do many science teachers. So weighing all of that out, no, we don't have a prescriptive district formula at this time. Okay. Are there any questions or comments for anybody else on the board, on the, on the committee? I do have questions. Um, my experience at my school, my principal was very supportive. She just ordered me a, a rolling cart for my new computer um, hardware that we've all been given. And um, we are photocopying more, but I hear that some sites have rationing put on their photocopying, which I think is probably a decision a principal makes. But for social studies in the face of you no know, textbook mm -hmm. and um, we're all sharing materials mm -hmm. now and maybe we just really want to do it soon so we end up wanting to copy it at school. Um, I have not had a limitation, but I know that other sites have had a limitation of um, a certain extent amount of sheets per semester and that's it. This is to encourage us to use central duplicating, but central duplicating in and of itself is sort of what we want to do, it seems. They, they do almost a 10-day turnaround. We are uh, very aware of possible limitations in duplicating, and um, we are looking at the efficiency of that organization and group and figuring out, kind of trying to get an idea of how quickly things are being requested. 
is mm -hmm. in the turnaround. Um, and that is being tracked much more closely. Also, the district is uh, working on it uh, coming for the board at the next uh, board meeting. Selecting a vendor to have a more centralized contract with um, copy machine people so that sites all uh, the copy machines, the fixing of the copy machines, I'm not sure about the paper for the copy machines, but that, that is much less of a burden on individual principals and sites in terms of maintenance and machine and more current machines, et cetera. But the district's going to keep central duplicating. You're not sending that out to a private contractor. For now, that, for now we have central duplicating, and we are working on making it as efficient as possible. We have heard that there were some Hold up to this um, is personnel going to stay the same number or is it, is right it now it's just a review of what there is so there's no changes um, yet but it is kind of like stamping things procedurally when did it get here what's the turnaround having a mechanism for errors that are sent out so we can track errors and fix them and all of that I'm not sure at that level of Accountability uh, was in place for a while about uh -huh. how it's working. Right, thank you. Jenny, I have a question about um, what is the term of that examination of the duplicating staff or what's happening over there? When can we expect to get some information from you about what, um, when we can, ex so, sorry, if I knew that I was going to turn something in and I could get it back in two weeks and I knew that that was standard, average, acceptable, then I would have a better idea of what I need to copy at my site and what I need to send out, for example. So I'm wondering how long will you be reviewing the situation at duplicating, and when can we expect to see some of that information to inform our fellow educators? I would not put a short timeline on that because um, our director of purchasing uh, will go out and return to job. So <coughs> there might be uh, that. Um, but our goal would hopefully be within three months and certainly for the beginning of next year. I would like, I don't want to make promises like we can't stick to, so I'm not sure for the next couple of months. I do believe for next year we will have a much firmer process in place that is much more reliable and dependable. That's reasonable. Thank you. So this responsibility comes under um, Mr. Wright. So over the course of time, if you have questions, you can call Steve Eichmann, who's right back there. Hi, Steve. Hello. Oh, and Steve. Kelly is the director of, Kelly Cook okay. is the director of Freshman Team, and she'll probably be here in another four, four weeks. And she's very uh, interested in attending to the issues of efficiency in all of her departments, and she also oversees warehouse, warehouse purchasing and duplicating some of our most necessary functions um, for day-to-day -day business operations. And so we are trying to create a very visible and transparent feedback loop where people can contact her with questions, comments, concerns. And, and I just wouldn't want you to wait to the next meeting to have any more questions answered. You know, there should be a free flow of information because their job is to serve all the sites mm -hmm. and deal with the problems that are, are that do with whatever it is whatever your need is and the biggest need at the time. I mean, administration is here to help the sites, help the teachers. So our, our goal is to open up those lines of communication so that there's, that that's your reflex that you would go to, the right, go to the right person, save yourself a lot of time and aggravation. And um, staff knows that uh, that is the goal. Um, it's, this is a topic uh, we have been kind of rolling around with for a while, and um, it, it kind of starts for me with what do the sites have and how do they dispense it. You know, it shouldn't be a secret. It should be, you know, I mean, we should kind of have a handle on that because I think the overriding issue here is equity, and it's tremendously important. I, I can't tell you the differences. I taught at four different schools in San Jose schools. There's a real difference among the, among the schools. And I was very well supported by the foundation at Santa Rosa High School. I had 
extra books that really were the core of my curriculum. I had all sorts of extra stuff. Um, you know, so I felt, yeah, this is the way it should be. But when I talk to other people, I know it's not so. So I feel it's a topic that we can't just say, well, you know, this is kind of the end of it. It seems like to me it's a bigger topic. And then we need to really take a look at, you know, how we do it and what we need to do and, and have a discussion about what materials are you getting from wherever. I know that people can write $30,000 checks for the school. I know the foundations can raise $100,000. I know that some foundation out of the district can raise a million dollars. But uh, we, I, I think it's a, a, a discussion that the union and the, the, the community needs to have. You know, how, do we, how do we look at this and support it? So one of the things we've done to that end is in every board report, we are tracking the uh, donations by site so that those differences in contributions can be seen monthly and the board can take those into account as they make decisions. The role of foundations is interesting because we, um, of course, their money is completely separate and all of our high schools now have one. Uh, none of our elementary schools have them. They have PTOs and PTAs, but not foundations that operate in the same way, per se. Uh, and our middle schools don't have them and they don't have to disclose the money that they spend. So some of that we we can't track. It's not our right per se to track. So I guess we could make individual requests of the foundation to disclose what they'd like to disclose about the amount of money they spend every year, like on teachers and and the things like in addition to um, things for their classroom, field trips, scholarships, all of those things that add up to contributions and opportunities for students. I think there. Some of that is uh, mass because it's not our dollars. And I think we actually talked about this last year and the idea, uh, and we can certainly bring the information back to the board, but it would be a trade off to invest more dollars in classrooms and not have it available for other things, whether that be personnel, salary. I mean, it would be limited base dollars. These are base dollar investments because they're things we believe all students should have. Well, the, I know the Santa Rosa Foundation as a nonprofit does list everything. Everything's very clear, and they have their purposes very clear in their in their, in their mission statement. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure about the other foundations, but uh, it, I don't think that's an issue. You know, finding out who spent what on on, on whom. It's just I think the bigger picture is what do teachers need, you know, for their classrooms to do the job correctly. You know, I think that's a very very important question, mm -hmm. and uh, you know whether it's to have a district-wide foundation or what the strategies are, knowing that our dollars are very tight. I just, I don't know if there's another step, I guess, in this discussion where you, we need to go further with it. And we certainly can begin asking. I think we do have an obligation <coughs> once we begin asking teachers what they want to find the money and then explaining the trade-off. If our dollars will go to that, I mean, we have to be willing to stand in that. Uh, and Again, those are limited base dollars. I'm not saying that that's not the investment we would choose, but we just all have to be clear what the trade-off is. Mm -hmm. I'd like to follow up with them. I, my, it's my understanding that all the other high school foundations are based on and were tutored by the San Luis High School Foundation. So um, I'm sure there's some difference from what okay. next, but, um, I think the big problem we have is, is that the foundations are limited to their school. By, by nature of their of their um, their donors, they have a loyal to that institution, and they want and they want to they want to spend their money there and support their their, their school. So um, the formation of a district foundation to me is really enticing and very important because that I think could be a effort where we're definitely lacking here, and perhaps we could start it in, uh, in at the elementary level. But this is a community effort. This is not about us carving out money from our budget to create a foundation. And I think there are some people in the community who are um, willing to kind of start to talk about starting that up and be the founders. Um, and we're, we would welcome that, the start of that conversation. But um, I think that would uh, be a wonderful thing for our district. And I agree with you. I mean, you see the inequity, and it's painful. Because um, there are such riches at some schools and then not at, not at others. And elementary too, right? Where there's some of the elementary schools here, we have I don't know how many we have now, where when the, when the kids get, go back to school, the parents write a check and there's no other, they don't have to write a check. 
but the parents don't want to go through all the fundraising. And they had such successful fundraising that they know exactly how much money they, they need to carry on those programs that they had going on, special programs they had going on there. So just ask the parents, would you be willing to write a check and no more fundraising um, you know, shenanigans for you? You don't have to do that again. Well, you know, most schools can't do that. So um, these are all things we, can, we need to, I think as a board member, oh, uh, right. we can go out there and kind of discuss things. I have drum up an interest, but I, or, or <coughs> that we can go over there. And I think actually legally a foundation must be outside the board. It cannot be a board source. Right. Um, but we can it. talk about it. Yes. And ask people to do it. And help generate the will. Right. <laughs> Down strong volunteers, right. and they dedicated. Right. That's how the um, telephone came about, where they donate the money to the sports teams and the um, electives. Mm -hmm. Correct. So that's a positive that's out there. Mm -hmm. there. There are schools, and correct me, is it Title I monies? Mm -hmm. Because there are schools that give. The chunks of Title One money, mm -hmm. and we're not a Rinky Valley is not a Title One school, so our bonus I look at that as bonus money is not there. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think those sites probably wouldn't call it bonus, money, okay? Right? <laughs> and that's part of the inequity, right? Because, uh, and, like backpacks and basic mm -hmm. things that uh, some sites would consider basic and expect a child to have. In most of those Title I schools, they know the child actually won't have it. So how they make up for that to even get to the same level of entree. But the Title I money usually isn't spent for those type of things. Well, it actually Sport can't be for basic salary. It should yeah. be for enrichment, not right. for like the basics of school. It's legally required to be that, actually. OK. I, I think find a paper and colored pencils and pencils and, and construction paper, all those things are necessary. So, yeah. Anybody in the back have a checkbook they want to write on a check? <laughs> I'm invalid starters. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to item number two. And um, this is the California State Curriculum Development. You all have this in front of you, which is media, and then you can ask for it. We can have questions, comments, and, and hopefully a uh, rich discussion about um, and get input. The, st the standards are they're there, they're set. We all, if I'm, now I'm speaking for Rinkin, I'm not speaking for any other middle school, we have developed a game plan so that we're on top of the standards and we're gearing our teaching towards that common core process. So we're on top of it. And the technology is a big entity in, in that aspect as well. So we're there. And I, just from listening to other people, I think we're probably one or two steps ahead ahead of most schools, but everybody's headed in that direction. Middle no school. Elementary? Um, well, there's a, a core group of elementary teachers that are involved in lesson study and um, the Mango project. We're really excited to be able to find this week. My site, my, we the convincers. My group of convincers will be getting together to um, interview our students and start the final lesson. So it's real excited. It's exciting. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited to see the work that I did in um, Project Lead for so many years to be continued because this is a continuation and bringing in the science standards along with the math. So, and it also keeps the math going. So I'm real excited about that. Thank you. And I know a lot of teachers are involved in the lab and they're doing more and lab work. One of the reasons I, we ask is just we know there's a lot of change happening in terms of curriculum. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, and not always a lot of time to do it. So thinking about how it's all organized, how it's happening across 
grade level subject area schools and the district, right? Knowing that there needs to be some way of alignment through that all. Everyone won't get the same place in the same space, but we all have to kind of be marching to the same music. And how do we make sure that everybody feels supported in where they are in the process is really kind of the, the discussion we'd like to hear, like give us feedback about things we might be able to do differently or more of or less of. Or more so I would ask though, do they want to come on Saturdays, evenings, or the summer? Right. And, and I say that saying we'd be paid, right? And I think to consider, is it always only people who volunteer? And when does, when are there things that kind of everybody needs to do? Because that's what we do as professionals when we have a conversation together. I don't have an answer. I just throw it out there for discussion. Well, I have two comments uh, to the most recent um, musing about whether it should be mandatory, the professional development. Don't we have two professional development days scheduled this spring? One. We have one more. One. March okay. So there is one. At least that's, that's. But even there, generally speaking, like what we've done with it, it's about time. Two of those days are mandatory, but we have always, and I, I don't see this changing, within that people can select. Right, so if you want to go to trauma-informed care, if you want it to go to a blood follow-up, if you want it to go to a subject-level collaboration or whatever the offerings are that have sprung up, you're not dictated to have to go to something. But the other thing I wanted to do was express my um, gratitude and tell the district how much the social studies get together at Marconi um, Center in Tamales was wonderful. We had a great time collaborating and sharing our stuff. And you know, the thing that's so neat for social studies is that the joy is back. Yay. Yes, why we get to play. Why do you why do you think that was so successful? If, if there are seeds from that to replicate and things. Um, we the scenic beauty of the locale is so wonderful, being and being away, the food was artisanal and fantastic, and um, the Wi-Fi was sufficient. It started to get a little bit sketchy when a whole ton of UC Davis people landed the last day we were there, but, um, but um, the other thing was the fact that we all had laptops and we were all uploading with each other and sharing our curriculum together. Um, it was super. It's just great. And so now we have this wonderful bank of lessons and ideas and we're sharing them and you can pull them out anytime you want and use them. It's just, it's great. Were those during the uh, school day? You know, that was um, one, day, one school day and then um, Saturday and then Sunday morning. Okay. It was great. You know, to piggyback on that. Did everybody go or was it an invitation only? It was an open oh, invitation to all yeah. middle school social studies teachers. So anybody? So four per school. school. Yeah. Oh, four people. Oh, four for school. Yeah. Uh -huh. Four yeah. my But you know, it also gave the teachers a chance to see who else, who at Comstock taught history, who at Santa Rosa Middle. And, and that type, all the schools. So you saw that face to face. And if you had something unique, then we could grab and run with that. So that was a positive. Thank you, Diane. We, we also strongly discussed standard based grading yes. and explored that. And we also looked at how TCI can reemerge in the classroom. And so there was a lot of looking at the common core standards. The other thing too is that Santa Rosa Middle is a humanities course, mm -hmm. which is a combination of history and English. So being able to hear in great detail about their models is also really informative for all of us. Mm -hmm. hey. Jenny, did you want to say something? Sure, I think one of the things that made that event very successful was that we had such a specific subject in common area. So it made those best practices sharing very effective at some other trainings when people don't share that same common subject matter, things are too too broad. spread apart, too broad. Yeah, and I thought, so I thought that that was. Um, so do you think it was because it was both subject and 
kind of very fan specific. We have um, done some work with Santa Rosa High to align our history curriculum with the high school, and that was also effective. But again, it was a small group of teachers from our site with a small group of teachers from their site talking about the same subject. Um, so I think narrowing down those groups is really was part of what was very effective. How many teachers were there? Five schools, four people. 15, 16. Yeah, there was about 16 or 16. I was to say, Art Warner and I talked about this group quite a bit, and he has always been very enthusiastic. He, I think another part of the component of this is the energy that some teachers have in harnessing their or letting go, I guess, is the real is a real issue. And he has done this, and the different people within our, you know, the whole district have done this for some time, where we have gone to conferences, made sure to go, you know, Art has gone out of his way to make sure that people feel comfortable meeting and do, having these kind of opportunities and it's a matter of values but it's also a matter that there is energy out there and I, I just see a lot of enthusiastic people ready to do this and do more of it. I think it's a good model. I, I know you guys had a good time and, mm -hmm. and it was very productive. You know. Yeah. No. Jen? Thank you. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, I wanted to share uh, an experience that a teacher I know had that sounds similar and helpful and that is that um, a first grade teacher from Steeling went with her grade like colleagues to the Asilomar, mm -hmm. is that right? Ooh, and yes. when they got there, there were not very many primary grade options. And so, but what there was, was a do your own thing and then report out option. And so they went to the general sessions and then they spent all day and they, for I think two and a half days, <coughs> they planned their entire year they worked all day, they said they were from home, they work late because there's no kids there, their meals are provided, they were like energized by the general session, but they said it was the, the most productive two and a half days ever. And we're really grateful for that, for that time. The really concentrated time where all their other needs are met and they're not distracted. Um, two years ago at Santa Rosa Middle, we were given four release days because we teach two subjects to kind of compensate for that fact. And very similar result to that, those were incredibly productive. And we came together as a grade level team in our English and history and laid a foundation that I think we're still working off of even though many of our members have changed. So I don't know if, if we can offer um, teachers release days. I know people don't want to be out of their classroom. Do people know that that's available? How do they go about that? I think that could be a really great option if we can't send people on all expenses for vacations. Days. So those were here. Those were in our library. We were in our library. Yeah. I think one of the things I think that generally happen everywhere release days. Of course, elementary kind of does it differently, grade level rather than subject areas or maybe subject areas. Well, I think one of the things we're finding though that. It's slightly difficult because they're not predictable days on the sub. So if that's happening at the same time, so we have, because of the shortage in the subs, limited kind of how many things can happen on any one day, not to exceed like, in our minds, 30 or 40 teachers out of the classroom, because after that we begin to not be able to make it because that's coupled with additional PN and six days. If that's also coupled with grade level or sites, and of course, you know, we have 25 sites, so one, you know, three sites do it all of a sudden, that's 20 more teachers we didn't predict. We don't necessarily record in one place all of that happening, and that hurts kind of our sub options as well, knowing that they're limited. They are happening though, but those are, um, I would say very different how they look in our organized across sites, but I do believe that most What is the status of a district calendar regarding trainings that are happening all, this, like, all at the same time? We do, we have that, it's on the website, um, and that's been available since the beginning of the year. That doesn't include what a site would do independently, because that's not, yeah. right? Those aren't, like that, you don't ask for permission for that. You have your money, you set it up, you do it, you talk to your leadership team or your grade level teams, everybody's prepared that. So would it be helpful to have communication between the site and the district? We have teachers requesting release time. Can, would that be helpful? 
it would Should be helpful. Be I mean, I let happen. kind of Jason answer that because he's the one who comes in in the morning to juggle the sub issue. Um, I imagine it couldn't hurt. Yeah, it certainly would be helpful. I mean, it would be great because none of that is planned like, you know, the Tuesday before. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, logistics that have to be in place to make that happen. And any communication that can take place in advance, because if they called myself or they called Diane or Anna and said, hey, we want to have eight teachers out this day, I can go onto that calendar or I can refer them to that calendar and say, well, we already have 30, you know, second grade teachers doing GLAD that day. So that's going to be a day you may not want to choose. Let's look at another day collect together to find a spot that's going to work better where we don't already have training in place. Diane, did you want to say something? Um, uh, Art was um, wonderful in taking on a leadership role to go and talk to all the core subject areas about doing this uh, conference um, format. And so it just so happens that middle school and high school were the two that took it up, but we did offer the opportunity for the four core subject areas, uh, both middle school and high school. The other thing is that the middle school, since you're here, has done a tremendous job and also not just talking about the curriculum, but um, uploading them to a common Google site uh, where we have housed math, science, social studies, and English. And so I just actually went to look at it again today. And again, they've done, middle school has done a tremendous job in getting the curriculum up there. And they're dying to get back together to do more. So. They, yeah, we just, they're, it's going out there. There's a link and, yeah. And I wonder perhaps if we develop a, like a rollout calendar where so you might not be able to do it every year, but maybe like every other year or every third year, you know, your subject and grade level is coming up so we can kind of give that experience not perhaps we can't afford it every year, but we can sprinkle it about so that everybody has that opportunity at some point without too much lapse in budget. So it's not always one subject area and one grade level that gets to it every year, but it's really kind of that passion and spread out across all teachers and subject areas. I wonder if it would be an opportunity to partner with some of the state in the summer to do some sort of camp, you know, where they can't, just can't take the opportunity to go away and take the I, I just think that there's a lot going on sometimes that we don't recognize or acknowledge. I know foreign language had a very nice workshop. Thank you, Diane. Everybody's appreciative of your support for that last Saturday. And it was, um, my wife came home uh, very excited. And uh, I, for the next two hours, I learned a lot more about what's going on in foreign, foreign language. But uh, yeah, at any extent, she uh, enjoyed it and thought, and I want to say that Carl and Mary Jo uh, Renzi did a very nice job, again, the point people taking that, that lead. And they, I want to acknowledge these people that take that time and put that energy into that kind of uh, a, a, you know, leadership role. Um, the only thing Carolyn said to me was that she was tired. Saturdays are not the best day in the world to go out to a workshop. And, you know, she wasn't. She said I wasn't as crisp as I should be or could be. But, uh, so I think the summer beginning or end is a is a, is a good idea if the teachers think that that's a better idea. I know a lot of teachers don't like Saturdays or after school or you know, 
a lot of teachers have told me they don't want to be out of class. feedback from last year was um, during our district meetings we had many many district meetings we called Sun uh, Sun meetings that, um, that were on Saturday and evenings that that uh, stakeholders would really like to particularly teachers like would like to give feedback based through their sites and so that made a lot of sense to us and so what we've done is reconfigure how we can gather feedback through sites, which you'll see on there, uh, will be through staff meetings, uh, ELAC meetings, school site council meetings, um, basically gathering the kind of information we did last year, but through the sites. So um, we've also provided opportunity for, we're looking at three times, so not every staff meeting, not every parent meeting, but like three times throughout, that principals and staff would gather that feedback. Uh, the principals would then share it with us. We'd actually begin revising and working on the LCAP much earlier than you know, April, May, uh, when we're kind of gathering at the end, but really gathering along the way. So that's the kind of different uh, format that we're looking at in terms of. Um, so we use a core group that represents the teachers that would work with you? Uh, that actually all teachers would and classified staff would be able to give feedback through their site. Correct. So but there's no small group that you meet once a month. And not for the not for the LCAP. Okay. Because it's such a really more much I think much more open process where there's a lot more feedback. We we do the revisions. We bring it all back to each of those sites, each of the core, each of the groups. But there, are, there's also for the very formal consultation with the union. There are three periods for that as well. So there's kind of all the teacher feedback, but then there's also you can see three, November three 19th, sometime in February, and then sometime okay in, in April, April, where that we would meet with all unions regarding the legally required consultation. And last year we only did that towards the end of the year, but we just know that it's good to do it early as well with that like SRTA and CSEA. Um, my last staff meeting was taken up with a uh, survey where there was no admin in the room and we took a survey about how we felt about our job and our teaching and all that kind of stuff. Is that one of the feedback? Um, See, I'm, I'm looking at my staff meeting as having been listed as one of the feedback days for LCAP. Mm -hmm. Is that part of your package of what you're analyzing? If the questions, if your particular feedback was specific to providing information about your school site plan, then that may be the way that Laura did that. So if the questions, I'm not sure what the questions were. The we questions, did not, we did not, we have not put out a formal survey oh. yet. It was best she plus. Just informed me oh, okay. Best plus. okay. So our, okay. both, so both of our sites had best plus. Okay. Plus, okay. okay. <coughs> Which is data so. that could still feed to that your SIPSA goals as well. So it sounds like we still need to have a staff yes. meeting. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. Good. Right. Let's 
Let's move on to uh, item number three, truancy. What are some specific examples of early prevention and intervention efforts that work to change the standard? We've formed a committee through SRTA, and John, most of all of you know John, he is our chairperson, and he's done quite a bit of research of numbers and, and amounts and what have you, as well as things that we can do to aid our, ourselves in the issue. John. We've heard John speak to it several times, Kathy. I wanted to speak to the presentation that Diane Kimura presented because I felt that she covered many of the social cost kind of angles about what affects truancy. And I don't know if it could be asked right now whether you're getting much feedback or making plans within the district to look at the social work aspect of it where, I, as I recall, one of your suggestions was um, designating someone who would be like a family facilitator and perhaps get families into referral situations that could help them function better as a family. Um, is there more ongoing work having to do with that? Um, are you, are you um, trying to develop a plan around that? Is well, SAY involved? Well, definitely. I think you've just named all the things that the DIRT district has worked hard to bring together through feedback from all stakeholders with regard to student well-being. And in, in doing that, what, I, what you just mentioned was, yes, we have brought in SAY at every single school because the social factors are things that do have to be taken into consideration when we're looking at uh, chronic absenteeism. So SAY family engagement facilitators, restorative response specialists, all of those positions are elementary counselors, additional counselors with the LCAP. We could hire five bilingual counselors, but we only have one so far because I can't find candidates. So all of those resources are really, really to support wraparound services, to not just say, we're gonna do this to you because you're absent, but really ask the question, why are you absent? What's going on that you're absent? So um, I have another question, which is the consideration of the amount of absences that are allowed per semester. I think the general feeling is that in high school, um, students are not conscious of what the, the how the system runs, and and they and <coughs> that they can sort of gate the system by being absent just half a day less. Um, however, we don't. We don't allow, we allow double the number that most districts allow. Is that correct, John? What is the it average? It varies, it varies all but over the was county. Was 10 the average? I, I no. actually, I want to, I just need to chime in. Lots of people fail. I find it very ironic that the teachers union wants us to tell teachers how to grade. That's how it feels because you don't need to wait for 20 days to fail a student. You don't need an absentee trigger. We have lots of kids who Oh, I wasn't up. looking at this about how we're grading the student, but I'm looking at like the number as it exists as a rule. But but again, I a teacher can fail a student for, and they could have been there every day. Sure. Right, because they don't demonstrate. So I don't, I find it interesting how we want to use absentee as a trigger for a grading but you don't need you don't need a rule. You don't and the and for those students, and we have Tosa starting to examine it, for those students, failing that class is not getting them, is not driving them back to class. Because most of those students are already failing. So as we talk about bringing kids back to class, which everybody agrees, they have to be in class, they have to learn, there is no shot when they're missing this many days, and it is detrimental to them and to us. I mean, there is no argument that about that at all and we all want to do whatever we can to bring them back but I, I don't know how failing more students and changing a day automatically and taking away the teacher right if a teacher is passing a student who has missed 19 days the teacher has made that choice okay um 
I'm looking at recovering ADA by setting a lower threshold so that, um, you know, those letters and the, I, I believe it's state mandated. So and the, the letters are issued. Yes, it is. And they are well before anybody's thing. I mean, it's after three and then after, I mean, those are much earlier. And, and they also <coughs> trigger things that, and quite honestly, some of our systems can't handle in terms of meetings around the campus right. with staff, including teachers and the families. And many of those families are the ones in crisis, so they don't show up to those meetings. I, I mean, you know, it's a variety issue. But, um, recovering ADA, as we looked around the state, one of the things that people are doing is the Saturday school. We couldn't find our way there. Um, last year, we hope to be able to find our way perhaps this year in a way that is a win-win for everyone and uh, works, but that doesn't that doesn't require any amount of days or policy of failures. We can start recouping that ADA on unexcused absences, you know, with one day miss, with three day miss. That's much um, easier to recoup than requiring kind of some of these policies. So there are ways like that. We're definitely open to um, other ways if they're out there. I think one of the things that we're fortunate for right now is everybody is focused on truancy, both the state and the national level, the White House. And uh, we actually, I brought some copies of that as well. And some resources, I'm sure John's already kind of looked into them and maybe your committee already knows about them, but just to share what we're looking at. But many of the things that the um, both Kamala Harris at the state level and uh, the White House initiative on chronic absenteeism. Everybody agrees that that's in school, right? That's what we want. We want them to graduate. Uh, these pro-social efforts of really strengthening families, starting early, looking at elementary school families where that starts. I mean, those are kind of familial issues. And then also at the high school level, uh, those could be familial issues or they could be student choice issues, right? That can be a lot of things, but um, knowing that there is at some times a point of no return where a student feels that they can't pass by coming, why come? Especially as they grow older. So how? Do, what do we do for that child? And we're coming back like you know three weeks later is a disruption to class because they've missed so much and they can't just kind of pop in. There's specific learning they missed. So those are important conversations we have to have about how to somehow catch them up and circle them back in. But um, the policy on how many days to trigger an F seems interesting to me because teachers don't need a trigger. That's, that's their purview. You can pass on yeah. those. Go ahead. I'll go after her. Okay. Jenny, I might say what you're thinking. Okay. I know. <laughs> um, I don't know that the F was what I saw as the primary issue I saw the primary issue as the ADA, okay. um, so I don't know if that got lost in translation somewhere. And so I think you're pretty much right on the money with what you're saying about when they come back, it's a disruption, they can't pass this and that. What options do we have available for them in the district? How do they get to Ridgeway? Lewis is now gone. What is the only option that's available for kids to have some kind of alternative school experience? The, um, class. I don't know, do we have options to accommodate these kids, get the ADA, give them an alternative situation? Well, certainly in Bridge, that's both an alternative placement and we would see you would collect the ADA with them. And the sites are determining how to get there. I think I'm making sure we have great teachers who can kind of be as flexible to how we might be able to use technology and kind of um, technology-driven assessments and curriculum that would allow it to be a little more individualized and not rely on a whole class moving at the same pace might be something we can use. Um, again, knowing that that's a temporary placement and that they come back uh, in time, whether that be a semester or a quarter or whatever. And then I, at the secondary level, kind of the movement in and out of Bridgeway. And you remember that other schools have alternative opportunities as well, whether it's Mesa, Grace, or um, Midrose. Midrose. Uh, those are fluid all year long. The problem is that does, well not the problem, but the challenge is 
they have a legal entry requirement, right? You can't be a ninth grade, well, probably an old ninth grader, but you can't, you can't be 12 and in those programs. So at the middle school level, our option at this point would be British. And so that has not been really, I think, made clear site to site what bridge is, what bridge is for, um, at least not at my site. And I think that is a site by site issue, and I think with, I mean, that's good information for us to have so we can make sure that every site has some basic information that they all agree on. The sites have been, uh, there's some minimum things we've asked in terms of how to get into bridge, but sites have definitely uh, been moving students in and out of their, um, well, into their right now because it's so early in the year, uh, in in the context of their own site. So, uh, but that's good to be back to have. An example is our Bridge Academy, which has already activated itself. It's a couple of weeks, I think two weeks old now. Um, we called the IPR grades and wherever students had two Ds and an F, they sort of came under the radar. Then we were looking at the first quarter as it was rolling around, and that really solidified results of who the attendees are. But the kids have been given flexibility. For instance, I have, believe it or not, a, a student who's in Bridge, but she comes to my early college prep class. And we discussed how she's going to bring in her tutorial questions because of the flexible learning she has there. So I think that it's it's a good mix now what we've done because focusing on the academic part of it for the students and the individualized attention that they're getting can really help them improve and step back over. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that, Kathy. Uh, we're not telling teachers how to grade when the kids are absent. Elsie Allen, and that's who I was on the phone with before the meeting, they, some of their teachers had given students D pluses that hit that 20 day, somewhere in their computer program, kicked it to an F. And so all those kids who actually passed with a D plus, they showed up an F on the report card. And that was an issue there. I don't know what grading scale they're using, but the computer said, mm, no, you have an F. So we're encouraging teachers to work with the kids that are having that difficulty. Well, and I think Elsie illuminated that for us because they brought that same data to us and the number there, like that percentage of kids who, they didn't mean, the teachers weren't actually giving them an F. Correct. The district policy overrode that and turned it into an F. So within their grading program, that is in there? Because of existing district policy, yes. The, yes. Yes. It, yes. It flips it over at the... Uh, District the 20 hour mark. Yeah, the 20 hour mark at the district level. Okay, so let me understand this clearly. I had kids who've gotten D pluses, and maybe two within the last three years have been at the 20 day mark, medical mainly, but they passed that class with a D plus. That's an excuse That's an excuse absence. Yes. Oh, okay. Excuse absence, totally different now. Uh, 20 days unexcused. So yeah. can we delete that from the program so that those kids who did hit 20 days but did make up work at the D-plus level will receive that D-plus? I know we cannot do that across the board. That's the but question of this policy and this 20 days. Is that actually what in alignment with what we want? Right, is that what we want? Okay. So that's what that's that is a great question. Okay, that, that works. And then you mentioned about starting at the elementary level. Yes. The misbehaving students in class, you catch them at the elementary level, show them that you don't have to be bad to get attention. If you're good, you're going to get that attention. And nurture them along the way. I want to pass this out as well. This is only part of it. This is like, I, you know, a and it has a little something for everybody, but one of the things we are involved in as a pilot is the Keeping Kids in School, which partners us with juvenile probation and the juvenile court to, again, have great attention to truancy, knowing it's an early warning indicator for so many things later down the, um, 
incarceration pipeline. And they're piloting at I believe, Lincoln Steel Lane and Mesa. And how we partner with other agencies to look at these root causes of truancy and kind of together um, change the behavior, right? Because that's ultimately what everybody wants to do. And the courts have said they don't want to take everybody to court. Well, they're not going to take everybody to court. So, I mean, there are extreme cases, I think, where they're willing to do that, but that is not where they want to invest their time. And so really thinking about how we can be both carrot and a little stick in the far away, if we have to be, but how how to blend together and um, provide those services. And so this has a lot of resources, and I don't know if I'm looking at a copy of the but I'm sure you've already seen it. But, um, and I think it also has things that we're working on. If you look on page 19, for example, I think everybody knows um, our data system is challenged. Yeah. Um, you know, the SIS, the Student Information System, eSchool Plus, and Rick, this year, will take us through a process where together, we all decide on a different student information system. We will implement something next year. That will be painful because a new SIS system is always painful. But ideally, it will be better in the long term. And that will help us both track attendance well, and get data back to make informed decisions. And so I think that will be important for us. Certainly we can use CV, data quest, and, and um, other sources, and that's important, but also kind of day-to-day, month-to-month, more frequent tracking of how our students are doing. And I think we really are beginning to do a much more comprehensive effort of not just us as a school system addressing these issues, of absenteeism, but doing it with our other community partners, knowing that they might need gas money to get to school, they might need babysitting, they might need all these other things that we know kids don't make it to school for, and how how can we help uh, families get past that? And how for the older students who might be self-medicating, who might be having issues of um, emotional distress, all of those other crises that might happen for preteen and teenagers, how do we get them the help they need, which again, we can do a little bit of, but really deep, serious, ongoing work we don't have the resources for for students, and how do we get them linked, and their families linked to all of it, many times it's not just the child, but how do we get them linked to the right resources? I don't think it's ever just the child, I think that's, I think some children are just stuck. Mm -hmm. um, Ron and then Jen. Uh, this to me is a very complex issue, yeah. and um, it almost sounds like when we talk about LC that we're talking about probably policy that should be different from other schools. I'm not positive of that, but uh, we we have different communities, and each community, you know, with the different reasons that people are absent. I think we can take a look at each school and say, what is it? And then, uh, as a teacher of seniors at high school for many years, um, the kids that would be absent from my class that were really good, but were gaming the system. And it's a very frustrating place for a teacher to be when you know that the person is playing it right up to the wire and there is no reason for that person to be absent. Uh, I know it creates a lot of work for high school teachers when somebody's out to go back and get the makeup work and so on. So I can see that frustration level. But when we talk about the elementary schools, we talk about, I think, the overall picture of um, you know absenteeism uh, and the growth that that we're seeing, I think that the issue is tremendously complex, and I think that uh, we have to look at it as you know multifaceted in terms of what our solutions might be. Carrot and stick. I think the stick has always been a little part. But when we had truant officers, people like to say that we have better attendance, but um, and they weren't really out busting people. You know, we knew there were families that were not doing their job and getting the kids to school. But um, I see um, the fact that the kids don't understand that just being able to get up in the morning and the parents of a lot of these kids and get to school and do things right and do things on, you know, get, to, get there on time is important in real life. When I went to the career fair and talked to the gentleman at the building exchange, they're looking for people right now to go to work. They want people in the trades. So if you're 18, then the next, that's number one criterion. If the next criterion is not grades, but 
are you going to show up every day on time? Okay, and then uh, are you, do you have a good work ethic? And then your grades should be good, and then can you cooperate with people? So there are people in the community that really value this. And that message, the kids may not be thinking that, but I don't know what it is we can do. There should be some incentive, maybe a, a separate degree or certificate that says you had good attendance, you had good punctuality, you were punctual, uh, you know, all the time, uh, whatever it is. But, you know, we used to have citizenship grades. I don't know if they still do that in elementary school, but, but it's, uh, it's a way to say that those skills, those things are very important. So I would propose that we have some kind of way to make it a positive thing and, and really let the kids, inform the kids that this is important too. I think it's important too. I think I know we've talked about kids gaming the system. I think that kids who are failing actually aren't gaming the system because they're not winning anything. I think if we're trying to address the problem of uh, kids who pass by the skin of their teeth, whether that's the amount of work they do, they show up one day on their test and not another, and that's a different problem to solve than a chronic churn where they're you know, life might be falling apart for other reasons. Mm -hmm. Because that student is not gaining the system. They are, like, not even in the system. There's there's a whole other realm of students who, like, are happy with a D, do just enough homework, you know, participate that one day that the teacher... That is uh, also another dilemma that faces our classrooms. And, and I do think that as we look at solving that issue, that might require a different solution lens, right? Cause we have a lot of those kids too, who mm -hmm. like just skirt by, especially as they get older and feel, you know, they've already limited themselves, whatever they want to do after college, or then, you know, whatever idea, you know, a 16 year old might have in his or her head about what comes next. I think that that is a dilemma, but that might need a different solution than chronic truants who, have, who were failing when they were already missing 10 days because they've never done homework, because they don't do well on tests, because they don't do any of the assignments. Like, that's a different student and a different problem to solve. Okay, Jen. Um, I uh, appreciate that we have so many systems in place now or we're putting in place to deal with kids on an individual level and the challenges that they might be facing um, individually or for their family. And then the options we have once they get behind in our you know, alternative programs. One piece that I am interested in hearing more about is are there models, are there programs in other districts or other schools where about really changing culture, um, really changing the culture of attendance where and even maybe models that, that work between staff and leadership kids or whatever where you're really changing the culture of the school and really changing the uh, <coughs> uh, sort of peer expectation. Um, and so I'd be interested if there are, there are you know, models, district models in that um, not talking about disciplinary but just the culture do you think every morning like I gotta go to school without even you know considering an option I think an element of the school transformation grant and the best work is really part of that and I think what the research shows currently is that positive incentives we get positive engagement we get relationships between students and students students and adults uh, one of the things that I've recently heard about that we'll begin researching and talking about to people is um, a teacher uh, home visitation program where the positive relationships between teachers, again, pay, da, 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 and we have to choose in on that because it's not a uh, But that those type of positive relationships matter. And the more we can have of them, the more positive adult relationships with either the family or student just the better that is. We are, I know it's boring, and I don't know what this will look like, and I don't know that this is what we'll all decide to do, but there were truancy officers back in the day. What does that type of relationship look like now? What would be a position that could, for those most um, critical students, what could that look like now? What would that strong position? Is it something law enforcement E? Is it something more social worker E? Is it more, like what does that look like now? What are other districts doing that that is proving to be fruitful in that area and bringing families and students back to the classrooms again? Because that's what we all want, they need to be. I think that, that the relationship part of that is really important and I sometimes worry that our move towards um, using technology as a way to communicate and as, a, uh, as, as technology a way to, to inform people and to communicate 
hurts in that way because when we all went to school, you, you know, you, you did the like talk to the person on the left and talk to the person on the right. And if you miss your class, they're going to call you. And I think that might be a lot more powerful than log into whatever or email your teacher. You know, if Genevieve is calling me and saying, what the heck aren't you doing? Why aren't you at school? Yeah. To me, that like might be a lot more powerful. And so that's, that's one of the things I think about is sort of a perhaps potential downside to more relying on technology in our communication. More isolation. Yeah, more isolation. Let me, the committee came up with this. And once again, I say John is leading us. It, some of the ideas is celebrate a students with good attendance. Mm -hmm. I can remember in the good old days, and mm -hmm. I use that very loosely, that we recognize kids mm -hmm. for being in school. Uh, that's definitely a positive, and it doesn't cost anything. Mm -hmm. um, and you can usually find community partners that are willing to kind of like wrap with stuff. Exactly, people, exactly. People, yeah. You can also um, create a handout at the beginning of school, especially whether it's back to school night or orientation, and talking about the positiveness of attending school every day. Because when you miss one day, you miss out a lot. Yes. Um, once again, having it part of open house, talk to the parents. Mm -hmm. We now have that link to all the parents. There's, I just go on the email parents and poof, they're all there. So I can drop them a line. So if we take advantage of technology, that's definitely going to help as well. Um, Target big schools with the big schools. Target the schools with the biggest problem. Give them that extra that they need to get those kids engaged to bring them back in. Get the administrators, the teachers, um, community leaders. I am sure that they would be happy to step in and say, okay, we will do this in order to get those kids in so that their truancy level will go down. Yes. And and make I think the public is aware. Because sometime when I'm out, when I leave Lincoln since I'm on this modified schedule, and I'll go to um, Staples or Office Depot to pick up something, if I see kids walk in and go, wow, you guys out today? You had a holiday? They'll look at me like, no. And then I'll say, oh, well, which middle school do you attend? They will say X, and I go, oh, your principal is da 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 da, and they'll look at me and go, Oh, uh -oh. Uh -oh. and I say, you probably don't want me to call and tell that you were here. <clears throat> so you're headed back to school. Yes. So that type of stuff, make the community, I know they know the holidays we have. So if you see a group of kids walking around in the mall, great, they're spending money in your store. Not great if it's between the hours of 8 and 3 o'clock. So we've got to make it aware the public needs to know. Kids need to be in school. You bring up a, another really good point, though, which is, um, and I, it was just a great um, lecture at the uh, Violence Prevention and Prevention Task Force. Um, they had a seminar mm -hmm. there. Uh -huh. And it, it was um, all about how kids don't have a sense of community. Mm -hmm. Grandma doesn't live down the street. Aunt Donna's not there watching to see if you get off that bus. And if you don't get off that bus, I'm going to be getting in my car looking for you because you're my nephew and I love you. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, there's going to be communication between all the parents in the neighborhood about what's going on. And I think this is where technology has done us a disservice because what, what we do now is we don't actually look at people's faces. We don't talk to them. We just do, do, do this. And so this was all about exactly what you said. Um, and I think some people will might disagree with you all. Some people will say, well, it's none of your business. Don't talk to my child. But that's what's missing. Mm -hmm. Is that personal, that personal touch where we, we know each other. Mm -hmm. And the kids know that there's somebody there looking mm -hmm. out for them, looking after them, and keeping track of them. Um, and this, this uh, presenter gave this wonderful example of mm -hmm. how uh, what's not happening versus what happened you know, during his generation, my generation, your generation. And um, so there's a, a, there's a lack of socialization and a lack of a sense of community, and I belong here, and I am loved, mm -hmm. and um, I'll hurt a lot of people if I mess up. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what's gone, so how do we, how do we get that back? Um, and of course, the, the answer here is with all the social services, and the, I'm not putting that down, you know, I'm just saying the network that we have is not there. Okay. 
I agree with you 100%. Okay. I also think that there's a disempowerment for the journey. Because I had a little boy that disappeared after school and mother couldn't find him. And when I talked to him, I said, you need to know that he's been my child out of place. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where, and he was in shock. He didn't know that anybody would, he would call the police on your own. So I said, mm -hmm. because I would be so concerned about where you were. So, I mean, and that's a, that's a disarmament of the parent. And he didn't see it as disrespectful. And he said, that is disrespectful to your mother. Yeah, you caused her pain. So that, to me, that's, when I look at a problem that I think that we are seeing with our kids that aren't in school, that's the one that's what it is. And so what can we do to, to help those parents when they haven't really taken that? Well, and I think there's a growing kind of body of research, even availability in the community of some very powerful parenting classes. But sometimes it's getting the right parents. Together, <laughs> right, right. It's a parenting problem. The right parents never go. Yeah, and so, right. how we make sure because some people mm -hmm. are, you know, missed a couple pages in the handbook. And so, getting the reinforcement about what to do when you're struggling and maybe stepping left in this moment instead of doing what you've always done. And we have partners that do that. I know SRPD has a, a program that works. Uh, CAP Sonoma has a program that works, but again, even off of our, on our own site sometimes, we can't get parents together. So we need to keep looking <coughs> at it. Well, you know, prior to the big push to use the computer to communicate with parents, I would call, and I had five classes, every parent four times a year. And if the kid was absent, I'd pick up the phone and call. And I think that was up until 20... 9, 2010, then once that changed, I noticed a change in the kids. Oh, sh sh nobody calls home anymore. And if we had that high truancy, this is just me. If I was in charge of that, then if Piner sends me a list of the kids who are not showing up, who are over the 20 days or at 18 or whatever, I would make that person a call home. If I didn't get anyone at home, I'd go out and find where they live. And then talk to the parents and encourage them to get their son or daughter in. Or arrange, hey, I know you live too far, two doors down from James. He is always at school. Why don't you connect with him? We need to make a personal touch. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I totally agree, but I also think that the, the sheer numbers well, are, oh, are overwhelming. It, yes. And that has to do with the whole <laughs> Ten of us. You know, I mean, when I was a kid, if, if my mother's friend saw me in a place where I was oh. supposed to be, it's just sheer terror. I mean, and she never laid a hand on me. You know, it was just, anyway, you know what I'm talking about, right? Exactly. And that sense of belonging. And, and the bottom line is, that's being loved. Right? People are looking out for you and caring for you and about you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a whole bunch of kids that do have that. We have lots and lots of kids. Oh, we do. It's yes. so yes. that, and it's not that the parents don't love them, it's that they're busy or they're working. Oh, they're working. And I think it's exploring things like mentoring programs, uh, older, like intergenerational things. How can we use some of the retirees in our community to connect with some of the younger ones? How can we use older uh, leaders, right, because we always want to develop our youth. How can we use, like, maybe even high school kids to help influence the younger kids about being in school and choosing the right thing? And it's, I mean, the research says over and over and over it's about relationship and how can we keep providing more and more really positive relationships for those students that are in the most critical like space that need that more than we can provide kind of just the teacher to, to the group of students. And I do think that we do have to think about some of these students and families do need a much stronger touch than just the classroom teacher and an email or a phone call to, the crisis is just greater than that. And so how do we pull our resources together? How do we identify them correctly and pull our resources together? What you said about more than just the teacher. The teachers are overwhelmed with all the social services that they are, they are expected to be following up on 
directing, doing themselves, right? So I do think we need we need these partnerships. We need to come up with different ways to address these social needs because without them, they're not going to learn. They can't learn. We're so grateful for the elementary counselors we were able to bring back, the additional support services of things like SAY and others like that. And I think now we just kind of have to figure out for the different grade levels, is that enough? What more, more does there need to be? And are there new positions we'd like to explore in the future or returning positions? What would they look like? How would we measure? How much do we I mean, those are all possibilities. Last comments? No. So, I have one little It's my first meeting, so I know. I'm really <laughs> bombarded with a lot. But I know um, it seems like the truancy letters are a big piece to this big picture. And it's really it's really great to look at these positive incentives. Because I know, you know, as a special ed teacher, I know they say you know, six positives to one negative will get you positive results. Um, but I know the truancy letters haven't really, it's not seeming to be like a, you know, a specific <coughs> deadline. I know Ed Code, from what I've heard, there are specific deadlines for it, like after three absences, you know, that should signal the first truancy letter. Um, so making sure that that process is followed. The reason I say that is because I have one student who's not actually attended school one day this year. He's um, on my IEP case, so we tried to get him in, tried to get him in, parent won't show. The first truancy letter was sent to the home, and that's really what signaled the parent to say, oh, I really do need to deal with this issue. Um, so I think it's really important that we follow that, because even though that's a punitive type of measure, getting those out, I think that is what potentially could bring the parent in, potentially get that parent resources that we're not even aware that, the, you know, that we can help and provide that, that parent. So I think it's really just you know, critical that we follow those you know, timelines. It's actually a legal requirement, and right. it's one of the reasons we took it back as a district and not a lot, right, to really take that burden off sites, because there are specific times that letter has to go out, and then further down the line, we can't take other action if we haven't followed right. these actions. Right. So I would love if you got the specific information to us so we can kind of figure out where the flaw might have been, but no, we have to follow those timelines. And that's why even the, kind, the tone of those letters isn't like that warm. Uh, and part of that is it's required by Ed Code, right? You have to know this and you have to follow that. And so um, they kind of are what they are. And for many families, it will be the thing that jolts them back. For others, that letter is not enough. The second letter is not enough. They need other things, right? And that kind of helps us tear out certain people who the letter brings some people back, gets them to clear up some absences if somebody hadn't called in, whatever that is. And then it lets us concentrate on the other group. Some of them. The second letter matters, and they fall off. Others, we just got to keep doing more and more and more because they're not responding to any of those good or uh, really more patient. Right. Just one last thing. Is this something that is so large and complex at this time, given the social, because it's so multifaceted that we need an ad hoc committee possibly to, to, to sit down? Uh, mm -hmm. There's so much input out there, it just seems like to me. I don't know how to gather that all and you know, I mean, we're looking at a whole different set of strategies to try and address this, and it just seems to me like it's a huge th district-wide kind of thing. Yeah, I think it'll keep coming up through the LCAP, because I mean, when we look at the students who have um, kind of detrimental truancy, they fall into those unduplicated count numbers. They are very specific to many of those profiles, whether they're students of color, low income, foster youth, or EL. So I think those are are part of the day-to-day -day work we do. Um, so I, I don't know how we don't talk about kids who are drunk because it is part of what we're addressing. But, but as far as a strategy or strategies, goes best practices to try and address those, are we going to do it by site plan or are we? No. no. This is not something that I think the district, I think sites can help within kind of a menu of options, but 
one of the questions I'm always asked is, is this school better than that school? And I don't know how we can defend this school gets to choose to do this for students who are truant, but this school wants to do that for students who are truant. How we don't offer equitable services to all students and offer only some families these options and not others, I don't know how we can. It, it's a matter of strategies, you know, mm -hmm. for me. It could be that some you have a variety of strategies for how do you, but it's those strategies are going to come from from the temple office and we're going to. Well, I think strategies, I mean, if we're talking about like whether the um, schools do positive behavior, um, like raffles or awards, certainly sites can decide what works best for them. If we say every site should have some ideas on rewarding positive attendance, then I mean, sites would have to think like that. But if we have district policies about failure, I don't know how you can select sites that that applies to and where that doesn't apply. A policy about student failure, that, I mean, that seems, um, that seems like that. I don't know how we can enforce that different rules apply to different students. There. I'm just, I'm just concerned. What's the next step? I guess is uh, what I'm. You know, well, what we have to about. gather data on things like the pilot program, keeping kids in school, where we're working with them. We have to make sure that we record data well, because I think one of the things we looked at are like for our, our elementary numbers are so different than other schools, yet we have fairly high attendance rates. So it's, it's I'm not sure we've always reported this information correct. I. I I don't know how really kind of in the same neighborhood we can be so different than Bellevue and Wright, and that doesn't seem to make sense with all the same families in many ways. So we want to make sure that our data is accurate, and then we have new interventions <coughs> that we just put in place this year, like counselors, like those additional essay watches. We need to make sure that they're working and how are they addressing this. I think we have to get some of those interventions time to work. And I think it's that, <coughs> that adolescent switch where the kids can be. I mean, I, I've had kids that have stayed home for seventh grade until they were found out because it was so hard. It's different. It's difficult. It's a, it's a complete switch. And that was years and years ago, not recently. <coughs> So I'm I wondering, um, how long will those say counselors be? Is this one year? Is this two years? Are they here and gone? How long will this, um, the family engagement counselors be on our campus? Is this a five-year thing? That's <coughs> those are driven by our LCAP investments. I mean, that's why your feedback is so important. Yes. And if sites are saying this works and it's things we still want or we want more of this or less of that, I mean, that's why the feedback and the data review matters. I mean, I mean, it, it lasts as long as A, we kind of have this money to make that investment, but B, as long as we believe that investment is making a difference. I think for some reason we felt that, I don't believe that this would be the case, but the elementary counselors weren't getting as much we thought we would get. Then we revisit, is that the right thing? Maybe we want to do something else. But that comes from both data and feedback from teachers and parents and everyone else, like, are these, I mean, we, we haven't ever, up until now, heard any negative data about counselors, but that's the kind of thing where we have to think, okay, this was a chunk of our investment, is it working? But I think the question is, is the grant money that's funding this, or is it our, is it our, uh, our, our LCAP dollars? It's our LCAP dollars. It is LCAP dollars. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not going to speak to the indefinite length of time for LCAP dollars. Right. Right. But it is, it, and it's LCAP supplemental and concentration dollars. It's not LCAP eight, <coughs> right? So that I think, I think it's teachers hear a thousand acronyms every year. They see a thousand specialist people every year. And these people are here and gone, and these programs are here and gone, and these buzzwords are here and gone. And so to make a real investment, to make a cultural shift, we need to know that something is going to last, so that we can get up to speed. We can learn how to use the system, and we can make this cultural shift. Because you know, are they going to be there next year? Um, that's a good point. Um, that's that has to do with our, our funding system in our state and our feedback, yeah. right? That we Great want point. this to stay. We want we want another. You know, we want more counselors. We want want more support that looks like this. We want that's where we want the investment of these dollars. Right now, what I'm right. saying is, 
we have seen different funding formulas yes. throughout yes. the state yes. come and go. Yes. And that is that and that's the dilemma mm -hmm. you're experiencing. So but right now we're getting a we're getting the dollars to support that. So yeah. That's and we get to make these decisions locally. Based yeah. on our needs. Yeah. Oh, we're making decisions. That's why these LCAP needs are so important. The feedback is what is working. You guys are on the, on the front line. You do participate most, but that's why the LCAP requires that you have that information, and that's how we come up with our budgets. Okay. Next meeting is November 17th. Okay. I can't read. I just can't see. Okay, you need to turn. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. You're like, please. Bravo, please. Yeah, 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 yeah